Our next speaker, Dr. Enrique Sala, is with the National Geographic Society. He's actually a explorer in residence. And the National Geographic Society is taking on a very bold vision of working on something called pristine seas. This vision calls for preserving in marine preserves huge parts, about 30% of the ocean's biodiversity by 2030. Now that is a big vision, actually. And our next speaker is gonna talk about uh, how they intend to do it using the geographic approach and scientific information to drive it. Uh, Enrique is actually an amazing person as you're gonna find out in just a moment. And you will come to know both his vision for doing this, he's actually the founder of Pristine Seas, how he's doing it both technically and also working with different organizations around the world to accomplish this. When I first heard it, I didn't actually believe it would happen, but now I have the confidence that it is not only happening, well, I'm taking, I'm taking his time, so I should just shut up and turn it over to Enrique. Maybe tell us your story, Enrique. Well, thank you so much, Jack, for inviting me to speak today to all the SRE users around the world. And I have to admit that I don't know how to use your software, <laughs> but in our team, we have very smart people who do, like the thousands of people watching today. And I'm happy they do because we've been able to use it to advance our plans on how much of the ocean we need to protect and which places are the top priorities. If I may, I'd like to share that story of why I'm speaking to all of you today. Um, when I was a kid, growing up on the Mediterranean coast of Spain, I was fascinated by Jacques Cousteau's adventures on TV. You know, we had a black and white television set and there were only two TV channels. And on Sunday evenings, the entire family was glued to the TV to watch the adventures of those divers. But I was born too late to become one of those divers. Instead, I studied marine biology in Barcelona and became an avid diver myself. I got a PhD in France. And shortly after, I became a professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California. And there I was teaching and studying the impacts of humans, the impacts of fishing and climate change on ocean life. And my job was to publish these findings in scientific journals. And I did pretty well, you know, publishing lots of papers with more and more data showing how fast marine life was dying because of us. And the more I published, the more I was rewarded by the university. I became a full professor. You know, I made it at a relatively young age. But one day, looking out from the ivory tower, I realized that I had been running in a spinning wheel like a hamster not taking the time to think why I was running so fast. I realized that all I was doing was writing the obituary of the ocean. I felt like the doctor who's telling you how you're going to die with excruciating detail, but not offering a cure. And that day, I decided to quit academia. I went back to the Mediterranean and took some time to think about my next steps. And in 2008, I decided to knock a National Geographic store here in Washington, D.C. Now, why National Geographic? Because it had over a century of experience in exploration, research, storytelling, and education. And I thought we could combine those assets to help save vital places in the ocean before it's too late. And that's how Pristine Seas was born, a project to help save the last wild places in the ocean. Over the last 10 years, we've worked with local communities and governments to create 23 of the largest marine reserves in the world. Areas where fishing and other damaging activities are banned and where marine life thrives. And marine life does thrive within these no-take areas, within these marine reserves. I have seen it with my own eyes. Now, I'd love to, to share an example with you. In 1999, a little place called Cabo Pulmo in Baja California, in Mexico, was an underwater desert. The fishermen were so upset with not having enough fish to catch that they did something that no one expected. Instead of spending more time at sea trying to catch the few fish left, they stopped fishing completely. They asked the Mexican government to create a Note a national park in the sea, a marine reserve covering 70 square kilometers of ocean. Not so large, but significant for Baja California. I returned 10 years later to the same place, and everything had changed. What had been a barren landscape was now a kaleidoscope of life and color. In just 10 years, it came back to pristine. 
Even the large predators came back. And you know who else is thriving? Those visionary fishermen. They are making far more money now from tourism inside the reserve, diving tourism, and fishing around it. And I've seen this miracle in many other places around the world. On average, the abundance of fish increases six times inside these reserves. The fish are larger, and we know that the large female fish produce a disproportionately larger number of eggs, which together with the spillover of adult fish helps to replenish the surrounding areas, then helping local fishermen. So if these marine reserves work so well, how much of the ocean is protected today? Well, today, only 7% of the ocean is in areas that have been designated or proposed as marine protected areas. But less than 3% of the ocean is fully protected from fishing and other damaging activities. Now, next question is, well, how much of the ocean we have to protect. Studies suggest a range of targets for protection, between 20% and 70% of the ocean, depending on what the goals are. But decision makers, politicians, need a bit more certainty. Also, soon the countries of the world are going to meet in China at the COP15 of the Biodiversity Convention to agree on how much space are we willing to give to the natural world, both on land and in the ocean. That's why in 2018, I put together a team of top scientists and economists to answer the question of which are the areas in the ocean that we must protect first? And how much of the ocean do we need to protect? And to answer these questions, we decided to focus on, on three main objectives. Biodiversity, marine life, food, and carbon. On biodiversity, we wanted to know which areas contain unique and irreplaceable marine life that is threatened by human activities. And we made sure to distinguish human threats that are available by marine reserves, like fishing, from those that are not av available uh, by reserves, like ocean warming, for example. So what we did was build a global database with pixels that are 50 by 50 kilometers in size, which is a small, a large for the land, but is relatively small for the ocean, and compile global databases on what species live in each pixel, what is the risk of extinction, how unique they are in the tree of life, and many other variables. And we came up with this map, which ranks pixels from the top priority to the lowest priority. The top priority pixel is the one that, if fully protected, would deliver the biggest gains for biodiversity globally. The second top pixel is the one that delivers the second biggest gains, and so on and so forth. But if we think of biodiversity alone, that's not enough. That's not going to convince country leaders to protect much more of the ocean, to go from that 7% that we have now to much more. And why is that? Well, because there is a conflict with fishing. You know, we hear often that we cannot protect more of the ocean because we have to catch more fish to feed more people. But that's a fallacy, because fishing catch has been declining since the mid-90s, even though the fishing effort has increased. And over three quarters of the fish populations today are overfished, meaning we are taking them out of the water faster than they can reproduce. But as we saw in Cabo Pulmo, marine reserves can bring back marine life and help replenish the fish populations around them. So we developed a new model to identify which areas, if fully protected from fishing, would produce a spillover of fish that is greater than the foregone catch in these places. This is the map that ranks the pixels based on their benefits to fisheries. If we protected the right areas in the ocean, these areas could provide an extra 10 million tons of fish and invertebrates for us to eat. That's about 12% of the global catch today. And the third and final objective of our analysis was to figure out if more protection would also help to mitigate climate change. To do that, our team produced a new global map of carbon stocks in the ocean and found that the sediment on the seafloor, the top meter of the sediment, contains twice more carbon than all the soils of the land. But bottom trawling, which is the most destructive way to obtain food from the ocean, drags heavy and huge nets on the seafloor, resuspending much 
sediment and the carbon in it. And once it's exposed to the activity of microbes, some of that carbon turns to, remineralizes to carbon dioxide, which is a powerful greenhouse gas that can stay a thousand years in the atmosphere. So using satellite data from Global Fishing Watch allowed us to track individual bottom trawlers. And we estimated that every year, bottom trawling produces CO2 emissions into the ocean, similar or larger than those from aviation globally, every single year. So if we protected the places where this bottom trawling is happening, and that trawling effort wasn't relocated elsewhere, we would avoid enormous carbon emissions. And that would help mitigate climate change. Now, if we think of each objective in isolations, there are trade-offs. Protecting the top areas for biodiversity could result in a loss of fishing catch, for example. To solve that problem, we developed a new framework to optimize multiple benefits, to optimize the three benefits. And what is clear, and, and you all know about this, is that there is no silver bullet. There is no single map, the single solution. Now, picking which areas to protect depends on how much we value the different objectives. If we gain the same weight to each biodiversity, food and carbon, if we value them all equally, this is what we get. Protecting the right 45% of the ocean would maximize the benefits for biodiversity, food and carbon. But we also found, unexpectedly, that if we gave biodiversity a value of zero, that means if society decides that biodiversity is something bad that we need to eradicate, then the minimum amount of ocean that we will protect would be 30%. So 30% of the ocean is the floor, the minimum area that we need to protect if we want to preserve marine life and all the benefits it provides to people. And our analysis get pretty wonky very quickly. <laughs> and we require our amazing data scientist, Juan Mayorga, to conduct analysis for individual countries when we are asked by government officials. So discussing with, with uh, you, Jack, you, know, you offered help from ESRI. So, um, so everybody should know that there, uh, ESRI, their amazing team of engineers, have been developing a new web-based tool so that everyone, including government officials, can click on their waters and see what the priorities are for each objective separately, but also for all of them combined. And we are confident that this tool will help countries to inform further protection of their waters. And this year, especially crucial for humanity, because like in 2015, we had the, climate Paris, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. This year, we have this COP15 of the Biodiversity Convention in Kunming, China, where the world is going to sign a new agreement on nature. This is absolutely essential. Do we need that target agreed upon by all the countries of the world? But the most difficult part is going to be implementation to bring this target into reality. And this is where geographic information is going to be absolutely key because countries are already asking, well, yeah, sure, 30%, but do we need to protect 30% more or less? Which are the areas? How much is it going to cost? What are the implications for fisheries? Now with this tool, we will be able to help countries not only be reassured that protection is going to benefit their fisheries and is going to help reduce carbon emissions, but also they will know that there is a tool that can help them implement that, that commitment. And this is something that we did not have before. This is why we are so excited to combine uh, the expertise of National Geographic and our partners of exploration, research, economic analysis, and storytelling with ESRI's capabilities and create this tool, have this tool available so we can achieve the goal that the world needs, 30% of the ocean protected by 2030, so we can prevent the extinction of many species, the collapse of our life super system, and also we can help achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. And for this, we will need the help from all of you, or m many of you. You, uh, as users, experts, uh, amazing uh, engineers in different countries around the world, there are databases that are proprietary. There are databases that um, you know of in your country that we, couldn't, we didn't know about or we couldn't access for our global analysis. These uh, expertise, those assets are going to be absolutely essential to help your countries implement that vision, that, that commitment, so we can preserve nature for the benefit of humanity and the rest of life on the planet. 
So thank you again, Jack, so much for uh, giving me this, this platform today. And I look forward to continuing working with you and your team at Esri and start working with our friends who are watching here in, in many countries around the world. Thank you. It's an extraordinary vision, Enrique, and so I, I very much appreciate it. It's bringing so many thoughts that we've had in this conference together, geoanalytics, providing the science base, geo-visualization, being able to communicate effectively, uh, geo-collaboration, uh, being able to collaborate with the members in various countries to get them to implement this science-driven vision so that it becomes a practical way to, to set up these huge reserves. It comes, of course, right out of National Geographic. Approach problem solving holistically. And your insight, your leadership, is not just going to save the oceans uh, and preserve these vast areas, but it also is an example, a kind of footprint for all of us to follow, uh, saying, I have a vision, and you had it as a young person, first diving, then uh, leaving the academy and doing something, and then doing all the work, I mean, all the hard work, all the necessary work uh, that really makes this vision come alive. So uh, it's a great pleasure for me to know you in my life, but also watch your footprints. There are examples for all of us to follow, Enrique. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jack.